In this integrated rangeland management class, we keep coming back to this idea that, um, gra that grazing and fire are two really important factors that change plant communities. Um, in a related lecture, we uh, talked about plant response to grazing, and now we're going to talk a little bit about plant response to fire and how grazing and fire differ. First of all, in order to understand the effect of fire on ecosystems, you have to think about the history, the kind of ecological history of the community. And some communities um, have less frequent fire than others. So, for example, tundras and deserts, they, they just don't have the biomass to really support frequent fires, fires, especially tundra doesn't have the climate. It has shorter growing seasons, colder temperatures. And uh, the cold desert is another one where in Idaho we see shrubs with often a lot of space between the shrubs and not a much uh, biomass to carry between. So we have fairly infrequent fires in those types of ecosystems. So plant succession depends on the abil ability of the plants to kind of compete and adapt to the climate. And it, they don't always have the ability to survive fire, but fire is often not very frequent in some communities. Other communities really evolve with frequent fly fire. Um, grasslands, for sure. Um, the kinds of systems that we talked about, how plants respond to disturbance, um, those aspects of leaving the meristem close to the base and really having the resources to respond to disturbance certainly benefit grasses and grasslands. And nearly all grasslands on Earth revol evolved in systems that had frequent fire every decade or two. Um, dry forests, such as ponderosa pine forest, is another example where trees will often grow above the, for the fire line and the biomass at the forest floor is pretty well adapted to fire. So those two ecosystems that are really adapted to fairly frequent fire and they, they just have systems to recover from that. Um, some, some plants and some systems even require fire to be healthy. Some plants require fire to scarify the seed and germinate after fire. Um, other habitats really um, require a cleaning of the slate, a removing of the plant biomass there so that nutrients can be replaced or can be released. The existing plants can be removed and new plants that are adapted to fire can come back into the system. And so that's just sort of the normal cycle of a succession in, in systems that are adapted to fire. Some terms that you need to think about when you're um, trying to describe how fire characteristics affect plants, especially related to plant severity. So, so here's a, a few terms that just to keep in mind. One is severity. Severity means the impact of the heat from the fire. So what was the real kind of mortal effect of the fire? Fires that reach 120 to 130 degrees Fahrenheit um, typically kill plant material and, and meristems included. So a really severe fire is usually one that has these, you know, strong, deadly effects, and those are usually associated with high um, temperatures. Another thing that can interact with severity is the residency time, and residency time is how long a fire burns in an area. And uh, certainly an intense fire that burns for a long time would have very severe effects, um, but residency time, even low temperature fires, if they stay in an area, for a long time uh, can can have some pretty severe effects. It's probably not unlike, um, you know, walking across hot coals. You know, if you're running across them, that's one effect. It's, it's the same temperature of the coals, but you could run across them and not be too damaged. But if you had to walk slowly or stand on the coals, that residency time really caused some damage to the bottom of your feet. The same effect, effect happens in, in plant communities. Uh, another to think, thing to think about in the effect of severity or effect on large communities is the landscape patterns. Um, plants that, the, uh, plant communities that are adapted to fire often ho um, host very patchy fires that can really quite rapidly recover after the fire because there's seed resources in the unburned area. So you get those little patches that are not burned and those provide seed sources for the adjacent areas. That's really important. So the sagebrush step, which um, which I and Steve Bunting work on, you know, that's something we really try to find ways not to stop fire, but to create fires that are at have low severity and really kind of move quickly through the system and leave big patches.
of sagebrush as seed sources. The really damaging part of these widespread fires where thousands and thousands of acres can be burned with very few patches of green or remaining biomass and those fires ha have not only the effect that they've killed the plants in the area but then those that lack of biomass and standing plants fosters erosion reduces the seed availability of the site and then it reduces the, the probability that any seed planted in that area might stay and be covered up by soil and, and germinate. Another factor that affects how many plants die in a fire event is the season of fire and the phenological stage of the plants. This is one thing that often benefits grasses in fires because uh, as they become dormant, they become good fuel sources, and we usually see fires in July, August, September in rangeland systems, and that's at a time when the plants are largely not photosynthetically active above the soil surface. On the other hand, shrubs at that same time can be still active and really damaged by fires. So when the fire occurs, really affects how damaging it will be to the plant. I'm sorry, when it occurs with respect to the plant's stage of growth. Um, in the same way that we talked about grazing avoidance and tolerance, we can talk about that with fire. So let's think about plant adaptations to fire, specifically avoidance. And fuel characteristics of the plant community need to be um, considered. So for the next few slides, I'm just going to try to um, give you some terms that we can use to discuss this uh, topic and then when we go later in class on in terms of how fire intensity and fire frequency and fire behavior affect plant communities, we'll be able to rely on these. The first is fuel load. A fuel load is by definition the amount of live and dead fuel in weight per unit area. On rangelands, of course, that might be like um, pounds per acre, kilograms per hectare, uh, in forests, we, that's often described as tons per hectare or tons per acre. So we're in fairly low fuel load areas, um, but still pretty important. And, and in those pictures in the middle of the slide, you can see how fuel load might affect a fire moving fairly quickly through an environment. And then on the right, you see a picture where the fire was moving along and then the fuel load was decreased at the, at the fence line because of grazing on the right-hand side of that fence. So that de decrease in fuel load stopped the fire in this case. So fuel load it really really affects um, how widespread and how intense a fire is. Uh, fuel size classes uh, vary. Uh, be they're a little different on rangelands than they are in forests, just because our fuels are smaller in diameter and and oftentimes herbaceous. But the definition of fuel size class is the dead fuels that are divided into size classes based on diameter. In rangelands, we talk about fuels that are less than a quarter of an inch, one quarter to one inch, one to three inches, or greater than three inches. Of course, in forest, they talk about much larger fuels. You might have heard, heard this term, a fuel bed or depth of fuel de bed. <clears throat> that is just the depth of the surface fuel layer. Um, it's the average height of that fuel that's within the combustible zone. <coughs> and so um, it affects the fire front, how quickly that fire is going to spread through the system because it, it's going to move along that bed of fuel. This idea of packing ratio is pretty important, uh, especially in herbaceous plants. It's the compactness of the fuel bed, so if that area right above the soil surface is the fuel bed, and in this diagram you can see probably what looks like it was supposed to be two sets of annual grasses. On the left, it's a low packing ratio. On the right, it's a high packing ratio. And the only thing that's differing between those two graphs is just the number of stems per area, and that's what affects that compactness. So you can see how that would affect the heat of the fire, the rate of spread of the fire. Um, and that's just based on the packing ratio, the number of stems or the compactness of the fuel bed. Bulk density is the actual fuel weight per unit area. So if you took the weight per unit area and you divided by the depth of the fuel bed, you'd come up with bulk density. So it's a cubic centimeter sort of measure. And then in these diagrams, we have a fairly small 
or fairly low bulk density versus fairly high bulk density. Severity, again, severity being the term of how, um, how much the fire affects the plant community, that is affected by characteristics of the plant and the plant community. Um, morphology can affect how uh, severe the f effects of fire are on an individual plant. On the very right hand, you see a picture of a ponderosa pine. It's really well known for having a bark that is really resistant to fire. It's a corky kind of waxy bark. And fire can go through and, and really be, um, the, the bark, uh, it absorbs the heat and it doesn't go into the cambium layer of the wood and doesn't kill the tree. So as we talked about open forests being adapted to fire, one of the reasons they're adapted to fire, such as the ponderosa pine fire, uh, the ponderosa pine forest is that cor corky bark that ponderosa pine has. The bottom two pictures are examples of how the chemical structure at the plant surface and the plant composition affect the fire. Uh, on the left is um, a ceanothus plant, a waxy uh, ceanothus. Um, on the surface you can, you can see that wax and that really reduces the flammability of the plant. It just reduces the fact that it's going to go up in smoke. It slows down the, the, the burning process and, and it could probably, it could stop it if it slowed it down enough and kind of um, insulated the leaf. On the right hand side, kind of in the middle, there is a sagebrush plant going up in flames and it's the opposite effect. It has volatile compounds in it that really increase flammability and we talked about that earlier, that sagebrush terpenes and essential oils that increase flammability. So there's two plants that exist in sort of similar communities. One has wax to really reduce flammability and one has chemicals that increase flammability. Bunch grasses, we've talked about grasses being really well adapted to fire, but their structure can influence how uh, severe the fire effects are. Bunch grasses are more severely affected than sod grasses, so on the left, crested wheatgrass uh, would be more severely affected because when that fire gets into that bunch, it can burn more slowly and, and, and then build up some heat and those temperatures could kill the meristems. On the right hand side is a pretty strong stand of western wheatgrass and the fire would move through that at a pretty steady weight, rate and it wouldn't have enough real bulk density to slow that fire down and create a heat source that might kill the plant. Even within bunch grasses uh, that severe effect can vary. On the left hand side is Idaho fescue. It's got really long narrow leaves that are just a really nice fuel and they're very tightly co compact. And so one of the things we know about Idaho fescue is that it tends to be pretty susceptible to fire because when fires get into those tightly packed bunches uh, the fire can burn quite slowly and quite hot and, and kill the plant. On the right hand side is a uh, blue bunch wheatgrass. It's a big grass, but it's got pretty wide open uh, bunch grass structure. So the fire will come along and it, it just won't build up the heat because of the bunch grass being more dispersed. How well a plant, a plant community tolerates fire then um, is influenced by a number of matters, especially the location of the meristem. Uh, below the ground surface there can be buds such as this where they're rhizomatous plants. If the plant, the grass plant keeps its meristem very low to the surface or under the surface within uh, you know uh, an inch of the soil, it probably, it, it typically experiences you know very brief increase in temperature and often temperatures that don't reach that lethal level. So we've al always talked about grasses being well adapted to fire and especially those that are rhizomatous or keep their meristems close to the ground are adapted to fire. Thinking more about those that location of meristems, um, we need you need to uh, distinguish between shrubs that re-sprout from the base and those that don't. So a couple good basal sprouters that we have in the Great Basin would include rabbit brush and horse brush. These are plants that when a fire goes through the sagebrush system they often will have a pretty low abundance in sagebrush. Sagebrush is a very competitive shrub, so these other plants 
will often have lower abundance, but then the fire goes through, they're able to re-sprout from the base. Uh, big sagebrush is not able to re-sprout from the base, so it's killed, and the only way it can come back into the system is with seed. So what you see here in this graph is just, um, I'm not sure if that's, uh, what kind of shrub that is, but it could be representative of rabbit brush or horse brush. Rhizomatous plants, uh, again, can reduce the severity of the heat that affects the plant, but they can also r increase the probability the plant will survive and recover after fire. Remember, t tolerance are the plant characteristics that allow the plant to survive the disturbance or recover after the disturbance. Uh, rhizomes are typically a really good example. They have um, an adventitious roots and they have axillary buds right under the surface so a fire can go through and they'll have those buds ready right away to start starting a new plant. Pine grass is a really good example of this. Pine grass is one that um, it, it's common underneath pine trees but it may not exhibit itself at all until a fire and then once that fire happens there will be a flush of growth from pine grass, and pine grass has sort of those underlying um, rhizomes. Um, the ability of a plant to tolerate or recover after fire is also affected by season. Um, if the growing points are elevated, that's harder on the plant to lose that meristematic tissue. Um, but also, if there's resources in the plant community, when the fire goes through, the plant can uh, recover, start photosynthesizing again, and assimilating carbohydrates. A lot of interest in how seeds provide uh, the ability of the plant to survive fire or tolerate fire, come back after the fire. Some plants have very hard seed coatings that really need to be scarified by the fire. Quite a few plants in the California chaparral are like this. Uh, they are adapted to fire, the chaparral system is, and uh, those plants have these hard seed coatings that when fire comes through, it, it breaks them open, scarifies them, and lets them grow. A good example in wood systems and forest systems is serotonous cones, such as in lodgepole pine. And there's a picture here of a serotonous cone. If the serotonous cones have kind of a waxy compound that holds the seeds inside of the cone. And then when a fire comes through, the, those, those leaves of the cone open up and uh, release the seeds, and it melts that wax that's in between those kind of leaves of the cone. Other plants are protecting their seeds simply by where they're located in the canopy. Ponderosa pine, again, a plant that's well adapted to fire, um, holds its seeds way up in the canopy and, and often will have um, a leaves, whirls of leaves right around those seed cones so that if a fire goes through, they're really protected from the fire and they're usually out of reach. Other fire adapted species, remember that when a fire goes through, it creates a nutrient rich uh, layer of uh, inorganic nutrients on soil that has limited uh, competition. So it's really an advantage to, for seeds to get into that newly created seed bed. And fireweed is one that does this really well. It's called fireweed because it's adapted to fire and it has these seeds that are carried on the wind. And when a fire happens, uh, just just a, a growing season later, those plants can really elevate and start to populate any areas that were burned. Um, the seed vulnerability uh, to fire really depends on where that seed is and what time of year it is and how much moisture there is in the seed. So even seeds that are fairly well adapted to fire can really can vary from depending on the season. Remember, the ability of a plant to tolerate depends on how well they can allocate carbon pat, uh, in their, their life. Uh, some plants are just better at mobilizing carbon and taking advantage of those soluble resources and recovering photosynthetic material after fire. So if, uh, plants that we say are well adapted to fire uh, are those that have the ability to mobilize carbon and build new photosynthetic material. A whole host of other factors influence how badly a fire affects a community. So this looks, this picture shows a system that looks pretty bad, pretty blackened. Um, but whether that will recover quickly or not can depend on the post-fire weather. Do you get a nice, warm, cool spring? Lots of moisture? Is it dry? 
cold, hot uh, summer, cold winter. It's a, how what the weather is like after the fire is going to determine what kinds of plants um, are successful in that ecosystem. Or po post fire use, we know that animals are attracted to areas that were burned because they're going to be mostly new material that's that's high in minerals. So that can affect whether plants survive that first hit of the fire and then post-fire animal use. And, and then finally competition between plants. Uh, the m plants that are most competitive in the climax or late cereal stages are often not very competitive early on. And other plants or ruderal kind of invasive plants can, can be more competitive and there can be competition between plants. So in summary, think about what time of the year is most damaging for grasses to be burned and why. And then think about what time of year is fire most damaging to shrubs and why. Uh, think a little bit about um, how grazing and fire differ as a plant disturbance. They both remove biomass, but they do it in very different ways. And some plants that are adapted to fire are not well adapted to grazing, and vice versa. But other plants um, have mechanisms that are uh, predispose them to surviving or tolerating both fire and grazing. So how does grazing differ from fire in its effect on plants? I want to pause if you want to write these down, but otherwise here's a list that I have that I think is important. Um, fire is not selective of species. It, it, it takes everything that's in the way, provided it is a good fuel. Grazing is quite selective even within plant part. So it selects species that are palatable. Fire selects species that are tolerant of fire or that can avoid fire. Uh, fire removes dead and live tissue. Grazing is preferential to live tissue. Animals avoid dead tissue. Fire produces heat. Grazing does not. The kinds of nutrients that are recycled is important also. Fire recycles nutrients. It burns up that organic material and turns it into inorganic forms of minerals such as nitrate. And it's those inorganic forms that are used directly by plants. Um, nutrients from grazing are turned largely into organic forms in dung or in uh, cow patties or sheep dung. And uh, that organic matter has to be first broke down, broken down and turned into inorganic minerals and nitrogen by microbes. So it's a little bit longer process. Uh, in, urine is a, a form from animals that is an organic form. Nutrients are in fire are relatively evenly distributed across landscapes. Of course, wind can change that. But grazing pr deposits nutrients in pretty small little packets of dung, not widely spread across the plant community. Fires are patchy on a landscape scale. Grazing is patchy on a plant scale. Pick one plant over the other, or even one plant part over the next. Um, fire is most likely in the hot season. You, you know that if you're one of those people that manages fire or works on fires, it's always from about the July, middle of July till September, October when we start to do fire work because of the hot weather. It's, it's really advanced. Grazing can happen all year round. Um, it can be managed to help happen all year round. And then finally, grazing reduces seed viability. I'm sorry, fire reduces seed viability. It's true that some seeds are adapted to fire, but most often that fire reduces seed viability. Uh, grazing generally reduces seed viability, though some seeds require um, 
grazing to be consumed to become viable. And mesquite is an example of a seed that really needs to pass through the gut of an animal before it's even valuable. So that's just an overview of how fire might affect plants and how they might respond to the influence of fire in plant communities. And again, fire is a really important process in rangeland communities, so it's important to understand.